Well, you know, when you hear that music, it's going to be a good time because it is time for another edition of the Rec Poker Podcast Forums Edition. Just to see how many times I could say times and edition in one sentence. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Blusterini in the home games at Hold'em underscore Steelers. And just like every week, we are in here talking with the panel of wizards about a forum post from Rec.Poker. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, and website AMP. And I'd like to thank this field of furry friends for joining me, uh, starting with the one and only Chris Jones. I'm Chris Jones, uh, 5x5 on PokerStars and Twitter. I'm John Somsky, Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Rob Washam, Ratman50 everywhere. And I say furry friends because there is some very high quality facial hair on display with this particular panel, uh, a very hirsute group, if I do say so myself. So every week we get together and we talk poker, we pull a strategy uh, post from the forums at rec.poker. And while we're playing in the nightly home game to beat each other black and blue, uh, we go over it. So tonight... We are actually looking at a post by the one and only Radman50 himself, who's calling in from all the way down there in sunny Las Vegas. Uh, Rob, tell us a bit about this post, what made you decide to put it up there, and uh, what we learned. Well, what we learned is you should never just uh, mechanically do things. You should think through your Mm. actions before you do them. I think... Uh, this was uh, happened in a live tournament, so we've been playing for quite a while. Lines are 800, 1,600 with a 1,600 uh, ante. I was in the big blind, and I had 32 big blinds left up against the villain in the middle position with 40 big blinds. Um, he raises. Now, he's been very active. He's been very loose, um, calling down very light. Um, so when he... Three or when he opened to three big blinds, I chose to just call from the big blind with my ace king rather than getting into a raising war uh, pre flop, which I probably should have thought about potentially putting in that three bet from the big blind. Anyway, so what happens is I have ace of clubs, king of diamonds, um, and we see a flop of Ace of diamonds, jack of diamonds, seven of diamonds. I was the first to act. I've got top pair, top kicker, the nut flush draw. I'm, I've just flopped the world. I'm feeling like uh, everything is coming up roses. So I dunk jam my 27 big blinds into the pot of 10.5 big blinds. I think that was a mistake. <laughs> So where should and everybody we... I talk to agrees? <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, you said you were playing. You said you felt like, in retrospect, you were playing kind of robotically. Uh, mm-hmm. how, tell how long had you been in the session? Um, you know, like tell us a bit about the context of your of your. Well, let's see. It's a 20, 20 blind level, and they start at 100, 100. Um, We're at the eight hundred, sixteen hundred level, so we've. We've been playing for a while. We've been playing for probably four hours by now. Um, I know we've gone through at least uh, one break, maybe even two. So you know, it's a it, it's a quite it's a well structured tournament. It's quite. Uh, I mean, they don't skip very many levels as you get up there. So you know, we've been playing for quite a while, and I think after a while, you know, you just kind of get into the uh, zombie mode where you're just kind of reacting to what's going on around you instead of thinking. I mean, I still had a pretty good feel for the players and how they were playing and whatnot, but I don't think I was concentrating enough on, on ranges and bet sizing and that sort of thing. I was just kind of mechanically doing it. And it's nice. Yeah. I mean, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, I was just going to say, that's what I, I call that being in that <clears throat> mode autopilot. Yeah. where I just go on autopilot and it's like all of a sudden I have three bet King nine offsuit <laughs> under the gun. And I'm wondering what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of what it was. I'm thinking of a number of ways I could have played this hand differently. As I think about it, I mean, it doesn't really change the actual results of what happened in the hand. I think this would have ended the same way, no matter what, but um, I think I, I, I just 
just um, this, what I did was wrong. And so that just makes it feel worse. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, it doesn't, like I say, I don't think it changes the re- actual results of the hand at the end of the day, because I think it would have played out the same way. Um, but I did make some, some bad decisions. And um, so I'd like to talk about a little bit. Hmm. What would have been the better decisions? This is what makes Rob such a great player because he doesn't want to talk about the hands he's won. He wants to come in and talk about the hands that he can uh, learn something from. So that's what we should all have, that kind of learning mentality about uh, learning from our mistakes and looking for ways to improve. That's uh, that's how you get better. Chris, looked like you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, well, the thing, the thing uh, you know, in your own description, the thing that you wrote was MP has been loose and has shown the propensity to call very light. And so that is the... The, so like uh, the, I'm of two thoughts when I'm at this stack level, I actually kind of like working in ace King sometimes as a big blind flat, like you did. I, 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 I like that because it's, it's uh, something that, you know, people don't put you on it when you hit a hand like this. Um, it's, it's har- sometimes harder to get. If I'm up against an opponent who has not been loose and has not shown a propensity to call down light, I may f- choose to flat with this kind of hand um so i don't actually mind the flat in like it's not like this is a universal three bet but once you say that (laughs) now i want to jam this like (laughs) pretty badly um because i would love to be called down light in this spot because i've got a pretty good hand um so I mean, initially, that's my thinking is that. So you're thinking pre-flop, you might want to just uh, jam 32 big blinds in there? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Because I don't, I mean, I uh, we could we could raise, we got, what do we, we have 32, we could raise this to, I mean, we've got, we're out of position, we've got to, we've got to raise it to 11 or 12. I mean, I suppose we could, we could do that, we could get away, we could still have a 20 big blind stack, but I, you know. I, uh, probably... 20 big blind um, pot then too, right? Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I suppose, you know, we could we could find that kind of a raise. Uh, I think those are probably the two options there. But um, I, I against a player who's shown just a willingness to sort of call, I, I kind of want to get it in if I could. But, God, I didn't but even once think we, of that. <laughs> once we do flat uh, and we get to this flop... Um, yeah, I, I want to check for sure. Like with my entire range. Um, And and just for our, uh, for our audience. So the flop is ace of diamonds, jack of diamonds, seven of diamonds. We're holding ace of clubs, king of diamonds. So we do have the redraw to the nut high flush and, um, listeners, uh, who were with us a couple of weeks ago, we talked about a similar kind of spot with a monotone flop where we were in a position not not dissimilar from this and uh except in this case we've got top pair top kicker and the redraw to the nut flush draw to the nut flush yeah. so um Flop the world you this really did flop. right yeah, this is about as good as it gets yeah so yeah, i mean see, yeah i mean it's an exciting spot <laughs> for me um the problem is oh, so, so now you've got the flop excellent flop this is the type of flop and the type of hand that I would love to be calling someone's all in because you probably have more equity against them than they think they do. And you're getting, you're beating all of their bluffs and you have a great chance to draw out on any of the value hands that are there. If you decide to bet this, what can possibly call you? I mean, the only hands that can call you really are a made flush or a set. I mean, you're only going to get called by things that have you beat. Um, there's nothing that you beat that should be calling you on that particular board. Now, unless this guy is that particularly loose where he'll yes. continue at this point. <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah, then if maybe. we can get ca- called by – I mean, if you – I mean – we can get called by a worse ace, um, ace queen, ace ten uh, can find a call if we shove here. I don't know. I mean, but but aren't those hands going to bet into us anyway? 
Well, um, I, yeah, they were the initiative. They, they did have the initiative. So I think game flow says I should have probably just checked this flop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd be inclined. I mean, I love a good check raise. So I feel like that would be, this would be a good spot um, where you might be doing this with some bluffs. And so they might be more inclined to actually call the check raise with some of those hands that uh, feel like they might be ahead. You're ahead of all the draws, which is really nice. Of course. Um Hmm. So we got some good questions. We got some good comments in here. Uh, so Monkey System, our friend Keith, uh, says that he's jealous because he wants to be in Vegas too. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and he does some really good work uh, breaking down some of the different options here. So I encourage our listeners to go to Rec Poker, um, check out the forums there. This post is called MTT Standard Play. Um, Jacob Kiki also has a great breakdown here, and uh, Taylor Moss. Uh, add some ex- excellent notes as well. The consensus seems to be that Jam Pre is the is the best option. Um, I, I mean, I think there's some value to a smaller three bet size there, but with those stacks, you are kind of you're going to be out of position. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do like I do like the jam there. What do you guys think about that? Just just from the standpoint of sizing preflop, is there a non-jam sizing that we like there, uh, or is it just jam or or call? I, you know, I never when I'm this deep in and when I've got thirty-two big blinds, so I'm not I'm not in one of those uh, short stack ninja modes yet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. that we've been going through and and so i wasn't even thinking in terms of jamming um even over a open you know um he opened this could be a a perfect resale resteal spot but i felt my holding was too good to really um Mm -hmm. you know i didn't feel it necessary to jam now if i would have been holding something like pocket tens or pocket nines that might have been a hand that maybe i want to uh, go ahead and jam over the top, but with Ace King, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I, let's let's see a flop, and if I get something favorable, then yeah, let's go, it's go time. And if I don't, I can get away from the hand, and it's uh, and I'm and I'm down to 29 big blinds, and mm-hmm. I'm still still got a decent stack. So yeah, and, and when you do have 32 big blinds, I mean that's a big enough shove <laughs> that a lot of the dominated aces probably fold. So you're, you're, you're kind of getting to that point again, where they're only really continuing with a very strong range of hands. And I think you're still probably better than break even against that range, given the pot size, but um, it's not, it's not like that bread and butter spot where you're like, I've got 20 big blinds and right. there's an open and I'm mm-hmm. out of position. Mm-hmm. If you were in position, I could even see you raising to like eight or nine and then being able to play in position, you'd have some fold equity on that. Um, but out of position, uh, it, it feels like a deep shove, doesn't it? But I, it, but it's still, yeah. I feel like given the options, it feels like it's the right. W- would it matter to you guys if it was suited or versus off suit? Like, is this one of those stack depths where you're more inclined to call when it's suited? To, for playability or is it with the stack depth where you're more inclined to shove suited to get the extra 3% equity when they call? Cause Chris, you talked about maybe having a calling range here with ACE King in it sometimes. What, yeah, what, well, look inside your heart. Is it suited or not suited that ACE King? Uh, typically if I'm calling, it's, it's going to be not suited. I would say like, I, I, that puts me in sometimes the opposite of, yeah, uh, say. <laughs> of a lot of players. Um, uh, so and I understand that, uh, but I I tend to flip those around a bit. Um, with suited, that might be the type of hand where I feel comfortable going to that smaller three betting size, mm. um, because you know I I don't want to just I don't think I want to shove aces here uh, right. necessarily. Um, and so I need to have some hands that I'm willing to kind of go to a smaller three bet size that aren't just exclusively aces. And so 
uh, I, 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 I would probably lean to sort of some, some of those suited uh, ace king, ace queens as kind of those sm smaller three bet sizes. Um, is at least my initial thinking. It's a tricky it, stack depth. It really it is. is. And, and stack depth comes into it for me a lot. When I'm deeper, specifically talking about ace-king, when I'm deeper, I'm more inclined to call uh, with ace-king suited and to three-bet with ace-king offsuit mm -hmm. because it's not an all-in three-bet. Right. When I am shorter... And the shove is the decision. I'm I'm much more happy to get that suited ace king in because it's got more equity, and you right. are now in a position where you're actually going to realize that equity one way or the right. other. Right. Um, right. And uh, when you're shorter, I'd rather have that happen pre flop. Yep. And Agreed. when when I'm deeper, I like to see if I can actually get a, fl a flush out of there. Which uh, let's let's take a second and see if uh, Jonathan Little agrees, and then uh, we'll come back and talk about some of the post flop stuff here. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a pre flop raise or three bet instead? What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? It's like he's listening to us. What do you do with ace-king when you miss the flop? Wait a second, this is us. Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at pokercoaching.com slash recpoker right now. He makes a pretty compelling argument, folks. What to do? Should you call? Should you three bed? How to play that suited flush? I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about. So thank you, Jonathan Little, for that input. <laughs> so as played, um, we call. And I think, you know, there's an argument for that because you're keeping their range in a spot where it's dominated by your holdings. Um, you know, you're at a position which isn't great, but uh, whatever, we're here to play poker, right? Um, so the flop comes, again, just for our audience, we have the ace of clubs and the king of diamonds, and the flop is ace of diamonds, jack of diamonds, seven of diamonds. So we've got the redraw to the nut flush, and we've got top pair, top kicker. So there's 10.5 big blinds in the pot. We've got 27 behind in our villain covers. It's a monotone flop. A couple of weeks ago in the forums episode, we talked about how most of the time we're going to be checking here as part of our natural flow. Um, so I think there's, there's sort of like a conventional argument for just playing this as like a check and then either jamming or calling when we expect them to make that seat bet. Um, does anyone here think about, so let's, so there's the open jam, which is, uh, what Rob elected to do here. Top pair, top kicker in the redraw. Is there, is there a smaller sizing that we might consider in our leading range here as played? It's a donk. Um, is that going to elicit the kind of responses that we want from our opponent or is it better to have this as a shove or just a check? Well, the responses that we got out of the forum were it should be a check on the flop. If I didn't jam pre-flop, I mean, a lot of people are saying, mm. let's jam it, jam it pre-flop. And if you don't, if as played on the flop, I should have just checked. Been an op a great opportunity for a check raise, which might have looked much stronger than my jam pre-flop. Mm-hmm. Mm. It might, it may have changed the outcome of the hand. I don't know, um, but there's a possibility that the my opponent would have saw that as much stronger than uh, than my pre flop or my donk jam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a donk jam looks even weaker than just a donk lead. Mm -hmm. Um. And mut both of those look weaker than a check raise. And your hand really is strong enough that you can withstand the check check. Because if it goes check check, then odds are you've got the best hand at this point. Um, so, yeah, I, I think check with the intent of raising is probably my preferred line there. 
Well, you know me, I've never met a check raise jam that I didn't immediately <laughs> fall in love with. So I'm pretty easy to. Would uh, you check raise jam? Let's say he see bet to say five, six big blinds. There's 10 in the middle. Hmm. Well, we would know immediately that it wasn't Kim pet vet back there making the bet <laughs> because it's half the pot size. So we can elim immediately eliminate that. Um, 27 back. I mean, I probably do. I probably do. Mm -hmm. So the check, raise, jam, all in. I mm -hmm. think that's my play because I'm mm -hmm. going to be doing that with some other weaker hands as well. And so this feels like a good hand to have in that range um, that has, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty sweet hand for this flop. So, yeah. uh, it's a, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like, to me, naturally, in like the flow of the moment, I probably play that as a check jam, along with a bunch of other garbage. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you guys? What do you think? Uh, post flop here. What's what's your preferred line? Yeah, I, I agree. And the only reason I would ever, I, I would very rarely lead into this flop. If I ever did donk lead, it would be small, and it would be because I had an opponent who. Uh, if we, if this is an opponent we have a, says a propensity to call light, it would be one of those opponents that I read as like going to take offense at my small donk lead. And because <laughs> I, I, I'm looking for every opportunity right now to get all the chips in the middle. Hmm. Um, and if I'm beat, I'm beat, but this is too good a hand. And so, and I think the best way to do that is through a check raise. Yeah, that's a good point because even though you, I mean, I'm not sure who actually has the nuts advantage here as played, but you do want to get all the chips in the middle, right? Even though you've got top pair, top, like, it's not like you have the flush. Um, you're, you, you have a one pair hand, but I think you do want to get all the chips in the middle here. So the question is, how do you get all the chips in the middle in a way that doesn't happen only with their strongest hands? So mm -hmm. how do you get the chips in the middle in a way that makes them in, contort their range to include more of their weaker hands in that range when the chips do go in the middle? So that feels like that feels like letting them see bet uh, again in a vacuum. Like I know we're not considering every factor, but um, letting them see bet puts more of those chips in the middle, and then it makes the stack to pot ratio smaller when you do make that jam. And, I mean, as it turns out, they're going to call. <laughs> They're going to call anyway. So I don't, yeah. know, I don't know how important it is to make that stack to pot ratio of any smaller, but I mean, they might've come along with an even lighter uh, range of fans. Rob, do you want to, do you want to drop the devastating news on our listeners for how this? Yeah, it was, uh, he was definitely one who calls very loose. Uh, he had a ACE 10 spades clubs. So you're loving life, right? This is exactly oh yeah, I'm going. So this is he, great. He calls light, perfect. We got the show. Double called. up, baby. Double up. Go. And then uh, I get the bad news on the turn when the other <laughs> the other black ten shows oh, up. Guys, you don't even get the God. ten of diamonds. No. <laughs> no. And then they may just sweat the river too, eh? But uh, no diamond yeah. on the river to come save no you. Diamond no diamond on the river. No king. No. Nope. Ah. So I I tapped the table and went to my room. <laughs> ever ever the classy ever the classy player rob washam well knows knows how to leave the table well yeah and so like i said at the beginning i don't know that anything i would have done would have made a difference the actual how the hand played out let's say that i made a normal um three bet free flop he calls we get to the flop we get this flop we go all in same thing happens um, let's say I, as played, I checked, he bet, I check raised all in same thing happens. Yep. Um, yep. if it somehow went check, check on the turn and he turns two pair on this point <laughs> and I still have ace king with the nut flush draw, right. there's nothing stopping me from getting it all in. So no matter right. how, how I played it, I think the results would have been the same. But I think I uh, there's some options that I didn't consider in the moment that I wish I would have. 
Boy, that's why I love working with this guy. Yeah, uh, like you were kind of screwed no matter how this hand was going to go out the way. It like, yeah. honestly, you were. There's just no getting yeah. away from it. Yeah. And in fact, it, it, it you got exactly what you wanted. Like, yeah. like exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I I wish you the blessing of having this go this way all the time up to the turn. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> if um, I can play this kind of player every day of the week. Uh, sign me up. And yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes I'll tap the table and go home, but most of the time it's going to be really good for me. Yeah. Yep. And, it, and it's a good example of how you can find ways to learn even from hands that you couldn't have played any differently or, or that wouldn't have mattered if you played Result, the results wouldn't have been any different. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so big credit uh, to Rob for bringing this in. It's not, it's not the kind of hand that you play and then you're obviously thinking, Oh, I got to analyze this later. Um, these are the kind of hands that people lose and then they tell everyone how unlucky they were and then they move on to the next hand. So, uh, kudos, bud. I'm glad we got a chance to, uh, to talk about this. So, uh, any other thoughts on, on, I know we've been on a bit of a monotone flop kick for a while, but it's because it's such an interesting (laughs) spot. It's, uh, it's, it's just, it's the spot that I feel like people make more errors on flops like this than they do on other boards. So it's a good spot to have thought about these kind of things in advance. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I tend to be an equal opportunity error maker. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't matter what the flop is, right, John? (laughs) Yeah. I'll find a way to make an error. Find a way. (laughs) Find a way. That's great. Well, um, if you want to find your way to smallsmallbusiness.com, you can work with Steve Fredland, our fearless leader. He uh, likes to help folks with small businesses uh, move from chaos to confidence in this new world. So uh, I'd like to thank smallsmallbusiness.com. I'd like to thank Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, Website Amp, my buddies Chris Jones, Rob Washam, John Zomsky, uh, Steve for putting this whole thing together. Have a great night, everybody. Talk to you soon.